Welcome to an extended edition of an RCR story I recorded something like six years ago. I was never really happy with how sparse a lot of the information was in the original video, and I wasn't really thrilled with how it sounded either, so here we are. And we're back to talk about one of the most important shows in the automotive industry. And no, I'm not talking about Top Gear. You see, over the course of regular car reviews, we've done plenty of videos from the New York International Auto Show. But in all that time, I never really gave much thought to the history behind the show. And it's a pretty rich history. And as the requisite automotive history guy for RCR, I figured it was worth talking about. I mean, even just at the level of statistics, there's so much going on here. For instance, did you know that the average amount of time spent at the event for any given attendee has risen from 3.45 hours to a high in 2019 of 4.75 hours? Or that some 83% of the people who attend the show claim that they're motivated to go in the first place by the desire to shop? You know, they're in the market for a new car and they want some idea of what's out there without having to submit to a credit check. The New York Auto Show has always had a lot of reach. And yet, well, New York is kind of a weird place to hold such a huge auto show, right? Why would you hold an auto show in one of the least driver-friendly cities in America, with its potholes bigger than Halloween candy in a rich neighborhood, and awful, non-existent parking that's second only to Chicago? A place where the majority don't drive and the ones who do drive like it's the first time. Well, if you're fair about it, New York is kind of the only place an East Coast auto show could be held at this level, you know? Although there's a case to be made for the Philly auto show, of course. Regardless, it's not hard to see why the New York International Auto Show became as popular as it did. New York was willing to invest in drawing automakers in a sort of world's fair for automotive hype, with new cars making their debut, imports and exotics finally coming stateside, classic cars returning to the limelight, some of them in brand new iterations, and people of all backgrounds and experience levels and enthusiasm levels coming together to learn and celebrate and complain about cars. But in a general sense, that's what car shows have always been about. Whether it's your local cars and coffee on Saturdays, or an annual exhibition of vehicles that dance around price ranges from reasonable to downright extortionate. There's a feeling of community for any auto show, even when disagreements abound. And it's because, in large part, the enthusiasm for cars is self-evident. When you get to big car shows like this, I feel like there's a genuine enthusiasm that comes through. Even in those corporate, talking head segments that make up the bulk of each and every presser, or in the voice of every YouTuber filming content through a Samsung Galaxy, and breathing with the punctuationless ramble of free coffee and pure excitement. And I hear it in the clickety-clack-clack of every keystroke from the journalists feverishly keeping track of it all in the media lounge. But that was the New York Auto Show in its golden age. An age that appears to have long since passed. Fewer automakers are coming out to the show. Fewer big announcements are being made. And the quality of what you get is dwarfed by what used to take up show floor space. So what happened to the New York International Auto Show? Have claims of its demise been greatly exaggerated? Or is it in the August of its relevance? Let's take a brief look at its history, its rise, and its fall. Once upon a time, there weren't really auto shows in North America. Because there weren't really cars. Because the automotive industry wasn't exactly at a point to support car shows in the late 1800s. This isn't to say that interest in the automobile wasn't blossoming as we neared the turn of the 20th century, but that prickly rose we call the auto industry was not yet in full bloom. In 1895, the first American patent for a gas-powered car was granted to Charles Duryea, just one year before Henry Ford put his two-cylinder, four-horsepower Ford Quadricycle to market. Together with his brother Frank, Charles formed the Duryea Motor Wagon Company, 
and manufactured and sold their patented car, becoming the first men in America to make money selling automobiles. It was an act that essentially gave birth to the automotive industry in America, if you want to get technical about it, although there's debate to this day over whether or not the brothers were truly the first. Regardless, the rising popularity of the automobile was creating new problems to replace all the issues that plagued the business of horse-drawn carriages. For instance, in 1896, we had the nation's first car accident. It happened in New York because, of course it did. Long story short, some dude driving a Duryea hit a cyclist in what we can only imagine resulted in America's first right-of-way argument between a motorist and a cyclist. You'd be forgiven for thinking this probably would have happened in Portland with its cyclist-choked streets and trailways, but no. The East Coast holds this L. But regardless of who caused what and why, one thing had become perfectly evident. Cars were here to stay. Even if they did annoy people like cyclists, pedestrians, and even authorities like New York's Parks Department. Which sort of brings me back to some of the issues plaguing the business of horse-drawn carriages. Because on the one hand, having to clean up insane amounts of horse manure from your standard hansom cab was getting to be old hat. But it was the devil people knew. So the Parks Department put a ban on these new-fangled, horseless carriages. Of course, in trying to prevent the automobile from gaining a foothold as the new ass-carrier of choice, the Parks Department had inadvertently set the wheels in motion for the first New York Auto Show. Now, despite the fact that there were only about 8,000 cars registered in the entire United States at the time, plans were being put into place for a North American exhibition. Basically, the 27 founding members of the Automobile Club of America met at the Waldorf Astoria in June 1899 to discuss the future of automobiles in North America. In keeping with the reactionary nature of the auto show's origins, the Automobile Club itself was founded in response to the aforementioned ban on horseless carriages by the Parks Department. Together with investors, exhibitors, and auto manufacturers, the men organized the first New York Auto Show one year later. The event was held from November 3rd to November 10th, 1900, in Madison Square Garden, just a stone's throw from the Jacob Javits Center, where the New York Auto Show is held today. Among the vehicles on display were the popular steam-powered autos, the less-favored gas-powered models, and the attractive electric models, which were the stars of the show. Talk about coming full circle. More than any other horse-drawn carriage alternative, electric cars were intended to help clean up New York, since another issue with the horse-drawn carriage business was that the city had to remove some 15,000 horse carcasses per year in addition to nearly half a million tons, tons, of horse manure. And yeah, manure, th that's a big deal, but, I mean, are people literally just leaving horse carcasses in the road like that? You wouldn't think that... <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense. I mean, what exactly are they going to do, you know? It's not like they can just pick it up and take it home themselves, but... I don't know, it, was it a taxpayer expense at that point that everyone's paying to rid the road of these horses that died in the street? Ugh, it's just so grim to think about. Now, the foundation wasn't really in place to support the growth of electric vehicles, big surprise, since so many manufacturers were already hitching their wagons to steam and gas-powered cars. But the auto show itself made a point of illustrating the efficiency of these types of cars with a 20-foot wide track for exhibitions and a 200-foot long wooden ramp for hill climbing demonstrations. The first show was a modest event as the event totaled 69 exhibitors, nice, and 160 vehicles that could be classified as completed. But by the standards of its time, it was an impressive gala, drawing some 48,000 attendees paying just 50 cents a pop for entry. Although that number will shockingly increase, as you'll see later. <laughs> the show brought in over $24,000, which comes out to more than $1 million today. So it was only natural they would come back with another auto show the following year. The 1901 New York Auto Show was a tall order for the Automobile Club of America since it was considerably larger than the previous year's show. Word had traveled, and so too now, 
would people from around the country, basically. And that's just the attendees. Automakers and exhibitors wanted in on the show, in addition to the exhibitors from the previous year who wanted to keep their spot in the show. In short, the Automobile Club of America now had to find room for 92 exhibits. They also had to make room for some special activities, such as braking and handling contests. But the Automobile Club of America didn't have any other feasible venue options outside of Madison Square Garden. So they held it there again and faced the issue that the show was a bit on the crowded side. Yet it remained a success in its second year. Coincidentally enough, the second auto show coincided with New York becoming the first state in the Union to require license plates on all automobiles. And I guess it makes sense for the state in which the first car accident happened. Got to identify hit-and-run drivers somehow, right? Among the cars debuting at the 1901 New York Auto Show was America's first mass-produced car in the form of the iconic Curved Dash Oldsmobile which was driven to the show from Detroit, Michigan. This is significant because the 217-mile journey was the longest trip any car had ever completed in the United States up to that point, which added to the car's allure. But it had competition for Bell of the Ball from the Toledo Model A, which had a reputation for its time as one of the best domestically produced steam cars. I suppose the hype surrounding the Model A was a response to the rising popularity of gas-powered vehicles since the early years of the 20th century represented the start of a shift towards performance, as reflected in the Mercedes series from Daimler Motors and director Emil Jelinek. Cars like the 1902 Mercedes Simplex and the 120 horsepower Gordon Bennett model Mercedes were already making their mark on racetracks in Europe. While it would be some time before European performance found its way stateside, the wheels were already in motion. Naturally, the New York Auto Show continued to gain momentum throughout the early years of the 20th century. The 1903 event featured the debut of the Cadillac brand, with the classic Model A. In 1906, the show was host to the Ford Model N, the company's first pure economy car. Meanwhile, the 8th annual show moved the festivities from Madison Square Garden to the newly built Grand Central Palace on Lexington Avenue, as the show now had to accommodate some 216 exhibits displaying 251 vehicles. This show featured an increased presence for six-cylinder engines, which were gaining in popularity prior to the First World War. However, during World War I, the show continued unabated, clinging to that oldest of showbiz notions that the show must go on. But it was more than that. Over the years, the New York Auto Show had fast become part of the lifeblood of the American auto industry, and it largely helped carry the industry past those war years and into the Roaring Twenties by keeping enthusiasm for automobiles high and reaching potential consumers who might not have been enticed to purchase a newer model car otherwise. The 1924 New York Auto Show featured the debut of the Chrysler brand prior to its later becoming a company unto itself. Now, just a brief recap, but you can get this all in the Daimler-Chrysler merger episode of RCR Stories that I did a million years ago. But basically, corporate fixer Walter Chrysler rescued failing automotive manufacturer Maxwell Motor Company with the invention of the six-cylinder Chrysler vehicle, which hit the market in 1924. Its success prompted Walter Chrysler to take over the Maxwell Motor Company and rechristen it as the Chrysler Corporation in 1925. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves because the six-cylinder is what came to the party at the 1924 show under the name of the B70 for its ability to reach top speeds of 70 miles per hour. But the show had more than just speed going for it, as the Chrysler B70 came pressure lubricated and featured such innovations as four-wheel hydraulic brakes, air and oil filters, and a tubular front axle. It helped push the company into the public lexicon, setting the stage for a brand that endures today, albeit with some rough patches over the past century. That is, if it's not an over-exaggeration to classify multiple bankruptcies and failed mergers as rough patches. 
As America entered the Great Depression, it witnessed the rise of the big three automakers in the form of Chrysler, Ford, and GM, along with the decline of luxury car brands such as Cord, Horch, LaSalle, Stutz, and Pierce Arrow, whose Silver Arrow was among the most celebrated models at the 1933 show. The car was considered a masterpiece of the era, but it was unfortunately the wrong car for the wrong time. The tagline for the Silver Arrow claimed that the vehicle gives you in 1933 the car of 1940. And this added an extra layer of irony to the whole mess since, sadly, Pierce Arrow wouldn't actually live to see the 1940s, as the company closed up shop in 1938, just five years after the Silver Arrow debuted. And hey, it was hard out there for just about every automaker, but it was particularly hard for independent automakers. Just before the stock market crash of 1929, independent automakers accounted for nearly 25% of the entire U.S. auto market. By 1936, it was down to less than 9%. You could see this reflected in the types of vehicles that were taking center stage at the auto show over the following years. Fully automatic transmissions became an option when Oldsmobile debuted the Hydromatic Drive, and the Pontiac Deluxe 6 would hit the show floor as a transparent display car at the 1939 show, while the Chrysler Thunderbolt would debut at the 1940 auto show as a concept car. Consumers wanted bigger. They wanted better. They wanted more. But most of all, they wanted to forget about the circumstances of their nation and of their own pocketbooks, if only for a moment. But then, you can't finance a car with hopes and dreams. I should know. With the downturn in auto sales, attendance to the auto show was also negatively affected, but not in the way you might expect. As America neared its involvement in World War II, the New York International Auto Show was seeing record attendance due to the record ticket price reduction over the course of the Depression. During the early years of the auto show, admission was 50 cents, but remember that insane price increase I told you about? Well, the price eventually went to an insane 55 cents during the day and 75 cents during the evening. Just completely, like, destroyed everybody's bank account. 55 cents and 75 cents. I, okay, okay, I, I joke, I joke. But, it, like, 55 cents in 1900 is about $20 now. So, you know, like, about one-fifth the price of going to the movies today. But by 1939, entry to the New York Auto Show was only 40 cents, which comes out to about $17 today. Actually, no, scratch that. I just punched this into the inflation calculator, and it's telling me it's worth around fourteen fifty-three dollars today. So, decently cheap. But the most trying years for the auto show were still yet to come. Now, I couldn't find any information on the early 1940 New York auto shows, and it was for an obvious reason I had stupidly overlooked, because at the time I originally made this video... I was still getting into the groove of making RCR stories, and didn't realize that one common event tended to thread its way through every single RCR story that basically ever got released. That's right, World War II. Because as a byproduct of the Second World War, President Franklin D. Roosevelt had essentially frozen the entire auto industry, ceasing commercial production on all cars, trucks, and auto parts during the war via the federal government's Office of Production Management. Beginning on January 1st, 1942, the sale of cars and the delivery of any vehicles to buyers who previously ordered them was put entirely on hold. Granted, some exceptions were made by the local rationing board for people who ordered cars prior to the January 1st deadline, and there were also technically cars rationed out during the war to those deemed essential drivers. But for the most part, commercial production had come to a standstill, as the entire auto industry was repurposed for the war effort. The heads of the auto industry at the time banded together to form the Automotive Council for War Production to oversee resource allocation and vehicle manufacturing during the war. 
In essence, the auto industry received huge government contracts to build everything from tanks to bombs, jeeps to airplanes, ammunition to helmets. Gasoline was rationed, and the speed limit was set to 35 miles per hour nationwide, which perhaps had the unintended side effect of making Americans pine for more exotic, faster foreign models. Because as American automakers would see, fascination in foreign car models increased tenfold in the post-war years, culminating in the very first International Automobile Show on February 5th, 1949, at the 69th Regiment Armory in New York. Aston, Bentley, Healey, Pullman, Jaguar, Rolls-Royce, Rover, Renault, Peugeot, and Simca Fiat were just some of the auto brands on display. And the international flavor of the outlier show was integrated into subsequent New York auto shows, in accordance with growing public interest. It was a natural progression and evolution of the automotive industry in the United States. And it would be reflected in the evolution of the New York International Auto Show. In 1956, the New York Auto Show went international. No, literally. This was the year they added international to the name of the show, as many foreign automakers began making the move west. The auto show itself was also on the move again. This was the year the show relocated from the Grand Central Palace to the newly erected New York Coliseum, a 323,000 square foot space that featured four exhibition floors for events just like this. Approximately 1,500 people held tickets on opening day, with Mayor Robert Wagner inaugurating the festivities by proclaiming the Coliseum as one of the wonders of the modern world because a prerequisite for being from New York is being able to boast about your city better than anybody else. In reflecting this attitude, foreign automakers brought their own wonders. For instance, Sweden made its New York Auto Show debut in the form of the Saab 93B Coupe, a car shaped like Carl Malden's nose that featured a longitudinally mounted two-stroke, three-cylinder, 740cc engine. They also brought along the Saab Sonic, bro! which is one of the more fascinating cars of its era. You can get the full story in my three-and-a-half-hour-long RCR story on the life and death of Saab. But to throw in a quick recap of just a very, very small part of it, Saab engineer Rolf Melda was a pretty big racing fan owing to his background as a racer. So he got together with a few other gearheads and put together a two-seat prototype that he felt would stun the entire racing community. The team developed the entire car on a budget of just 75,000 kronor, which is roughly $8,320 in Merca money. And when I plug that into the inflation calculator, it comes out to around $93,327 today. So they made this car for less than a hundred grand. Now, the rumor has always been that they settled on the name Sonnet after a Swedish phrase that roughly translated to, it's so nice. But this story, as it turns out, was apocryphal. As a former rally car driver for Saab, engineer Melda had to fight to get the Sonnet made, to the point where he and his team met in a barn to build the vehicle in secret. One of the people assisting the project was legendary automotive designer Sixtin Sasson, and it's he who is credited with naming the car after a rejected proposal for the Saab 92 several years earlier. Either way, the design was striking, and it managed to be a real head-turner at the show, making a distinctive first impression in North America for the Swedish automaker. Japan would also follow Sweden to America for the 1959 auto show, as Toyota joined Datsun, Daihatsu, and Prince as the first Japanese car makers to appear at the event. Toyota wowed audiences with the mid-sized Tiera, which would come to be known as the second-gen Toyota Corona, while Nissan brought its Datsun Bluebird to the party. Funnily enough, the Bluebird was intended as a competitor of the Corona, not just on the market, but on the showroom floor. 
They were crowds mulling over these new, exotic foreign cars, and it was a reflection of the changing of the guard that signaled the beginning of the departure from the bulky, domestic cars of old towards the smaller, more fuel-efficient vehicles. This was a trend that was simultaneously ahead of its time and also overdue, considering that cars had simply become a part of everyday life in ways they hadn't during the pre-war years. Between the introduction of the interstate highway system and a recession that doomed such bulky, awkward vehicles as the Edsel, Americans were ready for a change. And while there were plenty of new cars worth checking out stateside on the horizon, such as the emergent era of the American muscle car and the small domestic car revolution led by AMC, foreign car manufacturers were making inroads in the 1960s thanks to the Toyota Corolla and the Volkswagen Beetle. Also, luxury cars were gradually on the rise again. For the 1961 New York Auto Show, organization president and famed trade show organizer Charles Snittow proclaimed that this year's event would bring about, quote, a new era of the common sense car that combines the best in engineering, the finest styling, and the most practical in day-to-day -day operation, end quote. However, the display of engineering efficiency would be somewhat overshadowed by a model in a skin-tight gown and a scarf longer than Easter Mass. It all centered on the debut of the Jaguar E-Type, which attracted a downright dangerous crowd of 47,000 looky-loos to the exhibit on just the first day alone. That's nearly as many people as were in attendance for the very first New York Auto Show. Despite the spaciousness of the Coliseum, the crowd was packed in so tightly in this one specific corner of the auto show that it was difficult to imagine that they weren't violating at least a hundred different fire code regulations. And what's wild here is that it might not have even been because of the car. The E-Type Coupe display featured Playboy Bunny Marilyn Hanold, who'd been Playmate of the Month back in June 1959. She was also an actress who had dated Elvis Presley in the 1950s, as the king of rock and roll had been impressed that Marilyn had starred in a movie with the Three Stooges. Elvis just thought that was really cool. The auto show was simply the first step in a larger profile for Marilyn in the entertainment industry, as she would go on to become something of a cult icon after starring in Frankenstein Meets the Space Monster, a camp classic so hated by critics it's held in an almost ironic esteem today. She also appeared on such shows as Bewitched and Batman, where she played the sidekick to Liberace's supervillain character Shandell and his evil twin brother Harry. And while Marilyn didn't exactly have a huge career like some Oscar-winning box office draw, from all reports, she had a pretty good life. Of course, I say had when I should really be saying has, since she's still alive today as of the publication of this video. But wait, why did I bring this up? Sorry, I just, I always find excuses to kind of do word salad about the golden age of Hollywood, even though technically this isn't really that either. Cars, Nick. S stay on the ball, you're talking about cars. Now, naturally, the E-Type debut made headlines and arguably did more for the New York Auto Show itself than it actually did for Marilyn. Or for the E-Type. You see, this was the year it became clear that the New York International Auto Show wasn't just for gearheads and auto enthusiasts. It could be a glamorous occasion that your average Joe and Jane could enjoy as well. Sure, many of the cars were cost prohibitive, but you were paying for an experience with your auto show ticket. The buzz, the excitement, the camaraderie. It's like seeing a blockbuster on opening night with a packed house that laughs at every joke and cheers at every big action set piece, and they applaud at the end. In this way, the New York International Auto Show became larger than life, and allowed us common folk to feel worldly through the offerings of foreign automakers and our proximity to these distant, inaccessible cars. And this would continue in the years that followed. The 1970s proceeded like a chimera of previous eras, with the fascination around previous imports coupled with the largesse of auto show pomp and circumstance. An antique car parade kicked off the 1972 show, while 1976 bore witness to the most expensive craft ever displayed at the auto show, in the form of the $38 million Apollo 15 Lunar Land Rover presented by NASA. 
the 70s would offer such luminaries of the auto industry as AMC showing off the Pacer for the first time, or Oldsmobile debuting the Starfire. Lotus and Ferrari were on hand, along with Subaru, Toyota, and Volvo. 1973 saw the Datsun 610 series to give the Pacer a run for its money. This, along with the Honda Civic Coupe, Lee Iacocca was there in 1975 to show off the Granada and the Mercury Monarch. The Toyota Corolla two-door was there, claiming to be the cheapest car in America at just $2,700. The Pontiac Sunbird formula package made an appearance in 1977. We even saw stuff like the Bricklin SV1. There was remarkable variety on hand in the 70s. And the New York Auto Show continued to build and build in the years ahead so that by 1984, over 700 cars were on display. And it was one hell of a lineup. In a sense, it was among the most significant years for the New York International Auto Show, considering it featured the debuts of the Nissan 300ZX, the Pontiac Fiero, and the Honda CRZ. It just further hammered home that American car culture was defined by its acceptance of and opposition to import cars. Case in point, import models accounted for a staggering 26.5% of the U.S. market in the early 80s, leading to concerns that the era of the American performance car had long since passed. While this wasn't necessarily the case, not entirely, one era that was definitely nearing its end was the Coliseum era of the New York International Auto Show. The New York International Auto Show moved to the Jacob Javits Center in 1987, where it became more popular than ever, on the basis that it was now the last stop of the industry auto show season. Its placement in the spring made it one of the year's final auto shows, and this allowed automakers to debut cars that perhaps weren't exactly ready in time for the earlier shows. It offered a sense of projection, the ability to see the future in the mind's eye, and get excited for it. It also allowed consumers to prepare their finances accordingly, since the show gave potential buyers just enough lead time to get Pennywise before going pound foolish on a soon-to-be-replaced Mustang SVO or something. I mean, it was kind of hard to resist a lot of the cars on display in this time frame, because this was around the time Lexus made its debut at the New York Auto Show. I believe it was 1989. Uh, let me check my notes. Uh... Yeah, 1989. And by this point, Lee Iacocca was firmly entrenched in Chrysler, stumping for the minivan and K-cars, while his former home, Ford, launched the Taurus. The 90s saw automakers stepping up in a big way at the auto show, with Mercedes-Benz debuting the M-Class at the 1997 show. The SUV was the first among luxury brands to come with electronic stability control, in addition to front and side curtain airbags, presented in an aesthetic package that aimed to be more appealing than the rival Jeep Grand Cherokee. Initially, the M-Class was intended to replace the G-Class, which had been one of the flagships of the Mercedes-Benz brand since the mid-1980s. Of course, as outlined in the Daimler-Chrysler RCR Stories video, the 90s weren't all that great for Mercedes-Benz, so they made a deal with Mitsubishi at the start of the decade to manufacture an SUV based off of the Montero platform. But the plans fell through by the spring of 1992, leaving Mercedes to continue work on the project in-house through 1993 and 1994. The M-Class was ready for testing in 1995, with pilot production beginning the following May, so that by February 1997, the very first M-Class would roll off the assembly line, just in time for the auto show that April. Despite struggling to compete with the more popular Jeep Grand Cherokee, the M-Class had an advantage over some of its competition by being conceived as an SUV right from the start. Competitors in the luxury SUV market were simply selling larger versions of far more conservative models. Over the course of the seven years of that first generation, roughly 650,000 M-Class vehicles were produced, and the vehicle sold pretty well in North America, although this didn't prevent the necessity of the Daimler-Chrysler merger in 1998. But luxury wasn't the defining trend of the 90s, not really, not at the auto show. 
The 90s brought us LH platform cars like the Dodge Intrepid and the Chrysler Concorde, the Jaguar XK8, and the Audi TT Coupes, to say nothing of the debut of the new Beetle. And this is just a brief sketch of some of the cars that were introduced in the Jacob Javits Center era of the New York Auto Show, because I'd be here forever if I actually went through even half of them. And while I'm sure you wouldn't mind, I'm not sure my voice would actually hold out. But the 90s were notable for another, less positive reason. In the years to come, the New York International Auto Show would be the inexplicable host to violent outbursts, beginning with an incident in 1998, which was among the most infamous. On April 13, 1998, two men in their 20s were stabbed at the auto show after a heated argument escalated to violence. Apparently, the argument occurred at the BMW exhibit, and while it wasn't clear exactly what caused the argument in the first place, witnesses claimed that one of the men tried to take a picture of a BMW Z3 convertible when another man stepped in front of the shot. Because BMW is the very definition of serious business, the man whipped out his knife and stabbed the dude who'd walked in front of his shot, prompting the victim to whip out his own knife and stab him right back. No, seriously. I, uh, the wounds weren't life-threatening. Y you know, one of the men got by with little more than a gash to his left arm, but... Both men spilled plenty of blood in the brawl, not that you'd have known it from the relative lack of hoopla over the incident on the show floor. In fact, the attack really only drew attention after the fact, because outside of a car show attendant who witnessed some commotion, raced over, and saw all the blood spatter on the ground, people apparently didn't really know anything had happened. A Mercedes-Benz representative, whose exhibit was near the site of the BMW stabbings, later told police that he had no idea that anything had gone down at all. Of course, the idea that this was all over a ruined photo op might not actually be true, as another BMW attendant who witnessed the fight claimed the two men had gotten into some kind of turf war over the car, which lends credence to the theory at the time that this was somehow gang-related. After all, what are the odds of a guy stabbing someone, only for his victim to whip out a knife of his own and hand him his receipt? And over a ruined photo that, considering it was 1998, probably was going to end up looking like garbage anyway. It all plays into a broader narrative of gang violence at the auto show, particularly as the event moved into the 21st century. The 2004 show, for instance, featured a gang member being arrested for sparking a riot, which prompted increases in security for the following year. But that didn't seem to curb violent tensions much. A huge brawl broke out at the 2005 show, following a confrontation between 80 members of the Crips and the Bloods, who'd made a tradition of attending the New York International Auto Show each year, since, as authorities would later learn, Easter weekend was now considered Gang Initiation Day among the local chapters. Three men were arrested in connection with the 2005 riot, all of them Bloods, and all of them under the age of 22. Now, in a fortunate break, no one was actually hurt in the riot, but it was still an unfortunate mark on the reputation of the New York International Auto Show. The three men were charged with disorderly conduct and resisting arrest. And I know, you're probably wondering why only three men out of the 80 who participated in the riot were arrested. Well, as it turns out, the offending parties had been asked to peacefully disperse, but they weren't particularly in any sort of mood to put up with authority. They got into a shoving match with the troopers and found themselves in handcuffs after the ruckus ended. In essence, they got the real-world equivalent of an instigator penalty in hockey. But still, crime was becoming a fixture of the auto show in the 2000s, as theft went through the roof in the years ahead, with then-New York International Auto Show president Mark Scheinberg noting that attendees were becoming more brazen. Scheinberg stated that manufacturers had gotten in the habit of removing anything that could be taken off of cars, from shift knobs to gas caps. And while this might sound a bit extreme, Scheinberg himself relayed a story of having actually witnessed a tire being rolled off the showgrounds by a particularly ballsy attendee. 
This is on top of petty acts of vandalism to the cars on the showroom floor. And it doesn't stop there. In the aftermath of the 2010 show, four people were shot and 33 were arrested in a turf war that occurred near the Jacob Javits Center. New York Police Chief Spokesperson Paul J. Brown stated that the incident was caused by young men looking for trouble. And it seems like they found trouble pretty easily. The first victim suffered a gunshot wound to the ankle at 8th Avenue and 40th Street, while a woman was shot with a BB gun near 7th and 51st. Later, two women near 7th Avenue and 34th Street suffered gunshot wounds to the elbow and thigh, respectively. This was on top of yet another riot that resulted in the aforementioned 33 arrests. As usual, no one died, thankfully, but security was once again increased in and around the Javits Center in order to ensure a peaceful auto show. As a result, things brightened up in the 2010s. The violence died down and so did much of the theft. People were generally able to start enjoying the cars again without fear of witnessing a shanking like it's that episode of BoJack Horseman where Todd goes to prison. We got the Dodge SRT Viper at the 2012 show, with the vehicle being dubbed America's most important performance car of the decade, and I'll let you make of that what you will. Later, 2014 would bear witness to Brian and I arriving for the first time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they would bear witness to the 2015 Acura TLX and Chevy Corvette Z06 convertible, as well as the North American debuts of the Alfa Romeo 4C and the 2015 BMW 4 Series Grand Coupe. Of course, you could go watch our 2014 New York International Auto Show videos for more on our experiences, since, again, that was our first year attending the show and we had tons to say about it. And you can also check out our videos for the 2015 show, which offered conflicting perspectives from Brian and myself. We missed 2016, but hey, you can't be everywhere at once. <laughs> But that year featured the debuts of the Chevy Camaro ZL1 and the new Shelby Mustang GTH, as well as the 2017 Mazda MX-5 RF, as Mazda continued that weird tradition where they tried to actively avoid calling a Miata a Miata. All in all, the 2016 auto show was kind of a banner year because it garnered exactly as many headlines as you'd think because the New York International Auto Show was in an upward trend of global popularity thanks to the proliferation of social media. It's hard to imagine this was ever a show spawned from a horseless carriage ban, but then that's part of the mystique of a show as intrinsically absurd and gloriously self-obsessed as the New York International Auto Show. It's the automotive equivalent of hedonism, of gratification for its own sake. Maybe it's kind of twisted to look at it that way, but auto shows in general are an exercise in bombast, in ways both big and small. And that's really kind of the beauty of an auto show. It's a bellwether to the rest of the world that, hey, cars are more than just an appliance. They're part of a broader fabric of our culture, one woven into who we are. Needless to say, the 2010s were a renaissance for the auto show. Over 1.2 million people attended at its peak, and our first year at the show was actually a record breaker as over 78,000 unique posts were made about the show online, and the hashtag NYIAS received a 110% increase across social media. And I assure you, we had nothing to do with this. Roughly 678,000 households attended, while TV viewership was up 42% and worldwide radio listenership hit 85 million. Print and newspaper coverage reached an unheard of 1.6 billion impressions. Although, what counts as an impression, you know? Eh. Like, you, you run out of toilet paper, you go to wipe with whatever's nearby, it happens to be a front page about the auto show, that's an impression, isn't it? Today, the New York International Auto Show occupies the 846,000 square feet of the Jacob Javits Center, with about a thousand vehicles on display during its peak. And the 2010s were a peak, because excess had taken hold at the New York International Auto Show. And I would imagine that's sort of the point. The New York International Auto Show is like one giant cheat day for people on an automotive diet. Maybe you don't go as hard as The Rock does on his cheat days, but you still get to pig out, gawking at all the new cars you get to sit in, scope out, and even test drive. 
Sure, you know it's all glitz and glam and pageantry, but it's that one time each year where the auto industry takes on an almost Hollywood luster. In the madcap amusement park of the Jacob Javits Center, it's hard not to get swept up in the roller coaster of excitement, disappointment, disagreement, satisfaction, and wonder. And the camaraderie, too. Because when we're not busy stabbing each other over disagreements, automotive and otherwise, car guys can generally be pretty damn cool, even as strangers sharing a mutual experience like this. Of course, for all that feeling of camaraderie, the decline of the New York International Auto Show was just around the corner, as the 2010s gave way to the 2020s, and a metamorphosis akin to degradation. Naturally, the decline of the New York International Auto Show could be linked entirely to that thing that happened in 2020 that we're not allowed to talk about on YouTube. For the first time in its history, the show was cancelled. At first, the organizers tried delaying it to August, only to then decide they'd try again in a year's time. But by 2021, little had changed, and so the show was cancelled once again. As 2022 rolled around, many of the concerns and fears people had about attending well-populated events had mostly diminished, but in its place was reticence on the part of automakers to even send their best cars in the first place. You see, when I talk about the decline of the New York Auto Show, I'm not talking about attendance figures. I never was. I'm talking about the show itself. Because whatever it is now isn't what it used to be. And sure, maybe that makes me an old man shouting at clouds, and Lord knows there are plenty of people who've been to more New York auto shows than I have. But when I showed up for 2022, my sense of excitement and wonder gave way to a crushing sense of disappointment. It felt as restrictive as trying to run in your dreams. On the one hand, the auto show struggled to rebound in the wake of the thing that froze the world, and kept us all indoors for a year and change. And I get that. But there's a pervasive, anemic feel to what the show is now, even as I recognize that it's not all bad, you know? In the past two years, the New York International Auto Show has given us the debut of the Eurospec Volkswagen ID Buzz, the 2024 Jeep Wrangler Refresh, the 2025 Ram 1500 REV, and the Ford GT Holman Moody Heritage Edition, in addition to allowing us to witness a Deus Vianne up close, or speak directly with VinFast representatives to get the lowdown on what exactly this company is and what it's all about. But even then, you don't notice what's there so much as what isn't, as the show has been plagued by major absences. A show that used to occupy three whole floors now struggles to occupy the street level. Among automakers who've either drastically reduced their presence or skipped the show altogether in recent years are Tesla, Audi, Jaguar, Porsche, Mercedes-Benz, Mitsubishi, Mazda, and even BMW, although at least without BMW being there, we might not get any more stabbings, knock on wood. Sure, some of these automakers have cars making appearances as part of collector offerings, or showing up in, like, the Radwood display that was there last year, which was a really cool display. But by and large, the auto show has the vibe of a 25-year high school reunion that none of the cool kids felt like going to. Covering up for the abject lack of automakers in attendance, some weird displays have been erected, like an electric vehicle test track that Hyundai put in the basement in the hopes you'll ignore that the cars won't be allowed to exceed 25 miles an hour, if that. Or the much-appreciated but not really car-related puppy exhibit by Subaru, which was awesome but didn't have nearly enough puppies or nearly enough free time to allow me to personally play with the puppies. Just let me play with the puppies, man. Come on, please. You gotta let me. Come on. Subaru also had their stalactite cave and their multiple video screens projecting an augmented reality background with a fog machine making it feel like you were stepping off the helicopter onto Isla Nublar. Wide-eyed and full of giddy skepticism about the possibility of this John Hammond guy actually recreating dinosaurs. But now, th there's hardly anything up front anymore. Just a lot of negative space, which I suppose offered a bit of forced perspective, because everything looks bigger than it actually is when there's nothing to compare it to. So, meh. Nah. 
Granted, I was there for press days, but it's hard to imagine the experience was all that different for the public. Ultimately, one might feel inclined to blame the pandemic. It got the show cancelled in 2020, and then again the following year. But 2022 wasn't the return to form that many had hoped, as the show felt like a distant echo of the grandeur and spectacle that had kept the show feeling relevant even just five years ago. And look, Nissan tried. They genuinely did. They offered marshmallows. They brought a lot of stuff, they got people to introduce it and try to cultivate a hopeful reception. And Ford did their usual Ford thing by drawing attention to muscle and speed and the occasional utility. And God bless them, Toyota was giving their full ass, with two hosts perkier than morning show anchors on their fourth espresso. I seriously don't know how anybody keeps up that level of energy, but they were doing it, somehow. I guess it's cool if you care about the new Supra or weird stuff like the Rhombus, or if you're really tight in the pants over the IS500. But for the most part, a lot of my excitement about the show centered on collector offerings because that's kind of where all the cool stuff was. Again, with the Radwood display and the RX-7s and the NSXs. Not even stuff like VinFast or Deus really got me all that excited. Maybe because I couldn't drive them? I, I don't know. And maybe that's just a failing on my part. A failing of expectations that were unfair. But the show just felt so listless that I found it hard to disagree with Brian's assertion that this would be the last time he'd go to the New York Auto Show. Because while I could easily decide to just go myself and gather footage for later reporting, I found that it ultimately isn't worth the trip in the same way it used to be. The soft gleam of wonder has been sandpapered to a coarse grain that leaves all the shiny new toys looking like they're ready to be donated to Goodwill. In a way, the New York Auto Show these days feels designed for people who've never been to one before. Because if you ever have been, it's hard to be impressed by what's on offer here, both in attendance and in presentation. Of course, the New York Auto Show is only as good as the efforts of the automakers willing to attend. In that sense, one could imagine that Chevrolet might actually care enough to make a big deal about the Camaro's swan song, or that Nissan would pull out all the stops to overshadow Ford just across the showroom floor. But the thrill of exoticism feels entirely ham-fisted by accountants who don't see the numerical value in putting company product into a truck to haul all the way to a city that smells freshly of hot piss and cold comfort. But why is this happening? Why is the New York International Auto Show on the downturn? Well, you could argue industry shows in general are becoming a thing of the past. Look at E3. It used to be one of the biggest events in gaming, if not THE biggest. But it saw its relevance decrease year over year until cancellations put the nail in the coffin. And while you could argue the state of the world is what caused it, the fact that there doesn't seem to be any rush to bring it back suggests the show might be done for good. And look at San Diego Comic-Con, THE big entertainment event for nerds and pop culture buffs alike. You couldn't PAY movie studios to stay away. Comic-Con was one of their biggest promotional bonanzas. But now? An unprecedented number of studios pulled out of this year's show. And on the one hand, the writers and actors' strike likely contributed to this action, but the fact that Marvel, Disney, Sony, Netflix, Universal, even HBO were nowhere to be found, that speaks volumes, especially since not a whole lot seems like it'll change in their absence when it comes to getting word out. The internet has changed so much about our lives and how we consume media, because there are very few experiences of which the internet can't at least offer us a facsimile. If I wanted to take a walking tour in Paris, I could look up a YouTube video that'll do just that. Or if I wanted to take a point of view drive of a car too expensive for me to ever own, which is most cars, that's another thing I can check off the bucket list. And all the better if I have a VR headset. Yeah, it's just an ersatz interpretation of the genuine article, but it's more than generations had in the past. Those were the generations for whom industry events were necessary. The ones that didn't have the internet and couldn't just look up what these cars were and what they could do in high definition and 4K. If you didn't see them on local streets or in magazines, you didn't see them at all. But more than any of that is the ultimate lack of true commitment from the automakers that remain. And I get that it's expensive to put on a show, to erect a display. 
I can't imagine what Subaru's video screen setup cost, or what their little walking trail area cost them, never mind transport for all the vehicles, paying all the attendants, and so on and so forth. But by the same token, what are they really offering to entice modern consumers? The type of enthusiast who'd go to the New York Auto Show isn't really getting their needs met, not in any meaningful sense outside of a few refreshes of well-worn models here and there, which is what kind of motivates my thinking that the ideology behind the show has changed to move towards a more general consumer rather than a niche automotive enthusiast. But then I guess maybe it's always been a general demographic show, and we were just reading into it an identity it never had. But without more Halo cars and interesting imports and limited run models, I don't know what there is to excite anybody who's super into cars that they haven't already seen before. We're just getting a lot more SUVs and trucks, and ugh, crossovers might as well be car show Ambien. But then, what incentive does an automaker even have to go to this show and pour all the expenses of venue fees down the drain when they could get the word out just as effectively on Twitter, I'm never calling it X, get over yourself, Alon. At least with these press releases, announcements, and demonstrations run directly by the automaker themselves, they have influence over the presentation while likely spending a fraction of what it would cost to be at a major industry event without having to share sight lines with a competitor. But does all this industry change truly spell the end for the New York International Auto Show? Or is it merely a bump in the road on the route to a comeback? Can the New York Auto Show bounce back? Of course, there's every hope that the auto show could bounce back. A study by Foresight Research found that the New York International Auto Show averages around 628,000 attendee households every year with over half of households in the market for a new vehicle admitting that their decision on which vehicle they would ultimately purchase was influenced by their attendance at the New York International Auto Show. Now, this 10-year study took place in 2020, so it remains to be seen what those figures look like now, but there's evidence to suggest that, at the very least, the New York International Auto Show still has a smidgen of relevance left from which to rebuild its brand. It's not dead yet, and I hope it manages to blossom again into what it once was. A big, beautiful, bombastic ode to the automotive industry. A bukkake of consumer interest, with cars of all makes, models, and price ranges, occupying a space where there's a 1 in 5 chance that every corner houses something you didn't think you'd ever see up close. The New York Auto Show hasn't always been perfect, but it used to be something that got me excited. These days... Not so much. But while Brian and I have sworn off ever attending again, I know myself well enough to know that anything can change. At the very least, I'm rooting for the New York International Auto Show. More options for auto enthusiasts to engage their passion is a net positive, in my opinion, no matter the scale. Although I'd argue local car meets and auto shows accomplish much of the same benefit. Either way, the New York International Auto Show has offered a lot to the industry, and to consumers, and its influence can't be discounted. If nothing else, I'll always be grateful for the experiences I had there, and hold out hope for renewed interest in one of North America's most iconic automotive industry events. Thank you so much for joining me on this extended edition of the rise and fall of the New York International Auto Show. Initially, when I made this video a couple of years ago, I basically just wanted to tell a brief history of the auto show, but I was never really satisfied with the video, and so I wanted to go back and really dig into why I think the show has been on the decline all these many years, and what contributed to its rise in the first place to where it became as important a show as it ultimately ended up being. Now, is it the most important auto show in North America? No. But it was very much a seminal show in the automotive community and the auto industry at large. And I wanted to convey that, and so that's why I added an extra half hour of material just to kind of expand on the subject and give more in-depth analysis, you know? Because to me, it 
the original video didn't feel like what RCR stories would eventually become. Now I am probably going to take this update approach again with past RCR stories because there are some videos that I feel didn't get the amount of detail that they really deserved. And so, this isn't just about creating quick and easy content. I mean, just redoing this took almost as long as making a regular RCR story, because I had to redo the audio, I had to rewrite the script in a lot of ways. I had to re-edit the video completely with new and old footage, but ultimately I feel like it will hopefully prove to be worth it and prove to become a series that, you know, I'm revisiting these tales, sort of like I did with Mickey Thompson, and with the entire history of the Corvette, providing a certain perspective that has been informed by time and as I get more used to making these videos. So hopefully you can look forward to more of those. It's also an issue of me wanting to put out something because the current RCR story I'm working on has been taking a while and I just really wanted you guys to have something of mine. And so, yeah, I'm really hoping that you enjoy this video, and if you did, please uh, leave a like, subscribe, tap that bell icon, and share it on uh, social media or to anyone who you think might enjoy it. It'll really help us. But for now, I just want to thank you for listening, for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, rest of your week, rest of your year. Take care.